Please welcome co-founder of Pick Your Trail Hari Ganpati, co-founder of No Footprints Isha Singh, and founder of Planet Abled Neha Arora. In discussion with Skift Asia editor Eden Bhutia. So reassuring to see so many people still in the audience. Uh, <clears throat> this is what I would like, and at Skiff, what we would like to call the startup panel. You know, <clears throat> we have uh, Isha, who is the co-founder of No Footprints, and in Isha's words, uh, No Footprints exists at the intersection of travel and local culture. And then we have Neha whose company, she's the founder of Planet Abled, and she is talking about making travel more inclusive for people with disabilities and the elderly. And then we have Hari, the co-founder of Pick Your Trails. Uh, Hari's company is trying to, it, it attempts to reimagine the way in which people book vacation, plan their vacation as well as book their vacation. So thank you all of you. And uh, as much as, uh, star as startups, they are trying to raise money, they're also trying to raise awareness about various things, about experiences. And uh, Neha, I would like to begin with you. Experiences, it's a, it's a beautiful word, and we've been hearing that a lot post-COVID. Uh, post but um, you told me that you are the only one you know, existing in this sphere in India. So why is it that people are not getting into accessible travel? And uh, is it because they find it very overwhelming? And clearly, because it's not just about building wheelchair ramps. Yeah. So see, the thing is, one, the most important point is the industry hasn't realized the business potential that inclusive travel actually brings to the industry. I mean, they haven't realize the numbers about it. We have 1.3 billion people with disabilities, 1 billion elderly, out of it 46% have a disability, and they hold $13 trillion of disposable income. But the industry somehow hasn't accepted this fact that this is a market they should be investing their time and effort into it. So that's one. Second is the perception about disability. I'm sure a lot of you must be thinking about wheelchair access at the moment. That's your picture of accessibility. But that's only 10 to 12% of the disabled population. And that does not need to have so much of infrastructural investment or changes that like, our stereotypes have in our mind about it. It can be pretty easy if you take it as a stepwise approach. I mean, 90% of the disabled people have other accessibility needs, and they don't need that kind of investment. So, that, that, that's one big reason. Also, if they have invested in the past into accessibility and you know, focusing on one disability group, they haven't seen the ROI because there hasn't been proper channels for them to reach out to the market. Because a group which has historically been ignored by the industry, they perceive it's not accessible. So until and unless you go and tell them we are accessible and we have done our work, they won't know that you are accessible in the first place. Mm -hmm. How many hotels have listed that they have an accessible room, even though for a compliance sake on their website? Less than 10, I think not even 5% of them. If you are not listing it, you're not telling it, how would they know it all even exists? And one big finding that came uh, last year, we did a stakeholder consultation at United Nations. We are now, we got together the industry and people with lived experiences of various types into one room to talk about why the laws are not working or the industry is still having so many problems. So if you see it on the screen, this is the gap that came into picture that what an industry is perceiving to be accessible. We are m meeting all the legal compliance. We are doing everything. But what the disabled consumer is thinking of what is accessible, it is a huge wide gap. So the purple dots are disabled people. 
like around purpose, their strength of the industry, and how their needs are being met. And if you look at the green dots, that's the industry claiming we are accessible, we are doing everything. So it's a huge white gap that is not being filled. There's clearly a disconnect. Um, Hari, I would like to come to you. Would companies like yours, like Pick Your Trail, want to work with uh, what Neha is doing? I think surely, uh, like Neha said, uh, it's, it's not just a function of a couple of small tweaks, but a larger level uh, because we're in the entire itinerary space, right? Entire trip planning. Yeah. So it's just not about one facet of the entire experience, but stitching together the entire trip that is in some sense friendly and accessible. So surely I think uh, from a pure uh, market perspective and need perspective, I think it's surely something that is needed. See, the I got you a client now. <laughs> um, and Isha, one, while we are talking about challenges, um, clearly something that you do is bringing neglected conversations about people, community, culture to the mainstream and talking about them, whether it is your Basti Sisterhood uh, you know, tour at Nizamuddin or the refugee food tour. <clears throat> but while you are doing this, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not very easy because you are also getting into history. And of course, all of us would agree that history lessons were the ones that put us most of us to sleep <laughs> while in class, right? So, um, and then when you are attempting to do something as different as not just these heritage walks, the mundane heritage walks, so what are the challenges in that? Mm. I think the challenges have multiple layers. Uh, definitely the, uh, at the design level, because we want to create, a, we never forget the vacation and tourism. Uh, we're very, very focused on the fun aspect of it. And to design something that's fun, uh, we need to partner with amazing community folks uh, to mobilize them, to make them see the value of tourism uh, and how that could be a side income for them is, is definitely a challenge, uh, which, which is where I think working very closely with social enterprises really helps us. Um, there's the challenge of marketing. Uh, the retrograde is still uh, what is getting highly picked up. Uh, so. We partner with amazing people. Uh, I think Mr. Deepak Deva is in the room. Uh, I'd like to give him a shout out because if large private players don't believe in stories like the Basti Sisterhood, the stories about women, uh, neglected conversations about the refugees, uh, you know, about Mumbai waking up, which started the story for us, our tours are not going to see the light of the day. Uh, so I think when you have the large players like see uh, creativity as a success metric, uh, mm -hmm. it empowers companies like us. So you're saying that, uh, you know, trying to make something, talking about history, but doing it in a fun way. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 we're, we're very aware that nobody's coming to Delhi to become an expert on Humayun. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody wants to go back and do like a fun family quiz. We, we know that what we have to design is a, a very, very fun experience for Delhi. Um, and sometimes we often ask our partners that like when you design a trip for your friend, uh, you know, if I ask somebody like, hey, so what do you want to do if you design a trip for your friend? The answers seem different because then they'll mention things like, oh, I'm going to take them to that Momo place uh, and I'm going to take them to this amazing, uh, you know, art and craft center. And suddenly when we're deciding like for a tourist visiting, suddenly we just stack monuments in one itinerary. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why is, why, why is that different? Uh, so we never forget the fun, the vacation aspect of tourism. Um, and we... As far as history is concerned, I think history is something that's very important. It gives the context to our present reality. So we treat history with a lot of fun. We, we, we take mm -hmm. our material almost like a stand-up comedy. Uh, we look for laughter mm -hmm. uh, from our guests. That's what we're chasing. And clearly, since you men mentioned Momo, being a Tibetan, I would like to say that nobody does Momo well in Delhi. Absolutely. So you should go to, you should go to Darjeeling or Gantok for it. Um, Hari, the post-COVID post introduced us to a new Indian traveler, right? This Indian traveler was not just uh, willing to take lists off the bucket list. And uh, when that happened, you know, it is, it is really interesting to see that, you know, I, I guess with Pick Your Trail, you had been seeing that, but that presented a great opportunity for, you know, companies like yours to do more. But as travelers get more demanding, how is it to you know, keep pace with the demand that is coming from them? 
I think uh, you're right when you said that a uh, lot more experiential uh, focus is on travel, right? Uh, and the like, same thing that Isha said, people want to have a lot more fun when they're out there and traveling. So clearly, as a platform, we've always envisaged that aspect of uh, people being able to put together their own itinerary. So in some sense, from ground up, uh, we've built that customization and personalization into our ethos. So it's a lot more easier uh, when the shift happened uh, post-pandemic, right, for us. Uh, but largely keeping pace with consumer demand, I think uh, we, we heard in the morning uh, from Campbell, right? I mean, every brand goes through that change of, you know, consumer segments changing and you having to keep pace with that. Largely today, the new age Indian traveler, especially the 23 to 35 double income, no kids, right? A lot more people having visa on arrival. I think it's becoming a lot more about instantaneous availability, experiences, right? And we're also seeing in the top 1%, people are willing to pay the additional premium uh, for a hassle-free experience. And I think uh, clearly that's been our target segment, the top 2-3% of India. And we're seeing that shift after the pandemic, especially where people have moved to experiences and are willing slightly to pay a premium. I think it's, it's worked in our favor. That's interesting to know because, you know, we've always known India as a price sensitive market. So are you seeing that people are, like you said, like people are willing to pay a little more? And we can see that, you know, when we look at the business class, uh, you know, section of the aircraft or premium economy, they're doing really well. So are you saying that people are now, uh, post-COVID, they are willing to pay more for real experiences? So I think, uh, like, I mean, like we've heard today, there are multiple Indias. Uh, there's one segment of India which I would not call price sensitive, but value conscious. And I think that value conscious segment of India is now especially post the pandemic, where you've really, all of us have kind of uh, seen the real value of money in some sense, right? Where it's really not worthless at some points. So the value conscious customers are increasingly seeking experiences, be it flights, be it accommodation, be it in destination experiences. And I think that's the delta between the price sensitive uh, customer and the value conscious customer. And I think travel as an industry is very experiential. So as long as you're able to deliver that experience, people are willing to pay. Uh, Isha, while we talk about the domestic uh, Indian traveler, you know, while Indians post-COVID were discovering their own backyard, uh, no footprints was also discovering the Indian domestic traveler because pre-COVID you mostly had inbound travelers. So how different is it to cater to a domestic uh, traveler vis-a-vis -vis, uh, an inbound traveler? Actually, not, we're, we're, we're not finding it that different, if mm -hmm. I can be honest. I, I, we, we did think it would be a trend and we weren't sure uh, how much a local tourist would be interested into their own backyard. So what spurred with COVID, which what we thought would be a trend, is now something that we're really looking as a primary market for us. Um, I think that the Indian traveler, I think social media really helped us. Uh, so we happened to build a lot of solid positioning for ourselves as a brand which is very, very focused on culture and community. And I think we've been lucky that we've been seeing the number of the, you know, the curious traveler who's interested in the backyard tourism only grow. Mm -hmm. uh, the trend definitely is that there is uh, somebody in the city who is, you know, stuck between that Monday to Friday and on the weekends, they really appreciate movements like No Footprints, who they can lend their voice to, uh, you know, uh, support uh, uh, very, very important conversations. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, there is uh, there, there is there is an East Indian village in Mumbai called Mathurpakadi, and uh, they're fighting uh, against the real estate lobbies to save save their uh, little beautiful village, which is probably the last few slices of heritage in Mumbai. And I think because of our social media movement, uh, talking about it, a lot of citizens came up, uh, started talking about it on social media, and are today helping the village with litigation issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, I think travel is becoming a very interesting vehicle for the domestic audience to know more, to bring that pride for the city and to care more. Uh, and that's the traveler we've been able to tap into. Uh, mm -hmm. We're also now launching our operations in Jaipur. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and very, very keen to definitely tap into uh, the, the, you know, consider now the domestic tourist as a, ta a primary target, just like the inbound. Uh, and now, since we're at the Leela, I must say that we also want to tap into the wedding market as well. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, of course. I mean, like, how can you miss that, Absolutely. right? Yeah. <clears throat> I'll come back to you with the social media uh, later okay. about social media. Neha, uh, you talked about the challenges. 
So what does it take to become, uh, you know, accessible, friendly um, travel entity? And most importantly, you know, are, how are the countries in Asia, I'm not talking about international, but I'm talking about how are the countries in Asia placed vis-a-vis, you know, accessibility? And, um, you know, do you think that India could have a first mover advantage in this? Because clearly, like, you know, I, I, uh, Rafat had mentioned at some point in time that every one of us is a future disabled traveler. So, I mean, like, let's not just think about uh, everything. I mean, this is a huge market that you need to cater to. And uh, India, des de you know, definitely inbound tourism, if we are talking about, we need, we need to bring those numbers, right? So could this be like India's great moment to shine if they, you know, have a first mover advantage in it? Oh, absolutely. Because you look at, like we earlier talked in the day, that the Indian diaspora is one of the richest in the world. Uh, like the seniors who moved, like the first or second or third generation of Indians who live abroad, they want to come back to India to either for pilgrimage reasons or to visit their family or go back to their roots. Or the mystics of the 60s and 70s who came to India in their, in their uh, young uh, 20s, now they want to come back, but they are either disabled or uh, elderly and they have accessibility requirements. So this is definitely an opportunity for India as a whole. And the, the, the advantage we as a country have is human accessibility. So we talk about accessibility in terms of built environment, but it has many aspects around it, whether it's digital accessibility uh, or your communication or information accessibility, which starts from the point when a traveler, any person for that matter, thinks about traveling. So like, how do they find the right information in accessible format to make an informed decision? Uh, is the platform they're booking, is that accessible for them to do it independently? So this whole life cycle, when a business is in the hospitality and tourism space, at every touch point, each business has to look at how there's, like, there's no breakage in the whole customer journey and how they can play their role of being accessible. And you have to look at all of these as aspects of accessibility. Uh, like, it's not just a ramp or a toilet that will, you know, ch change things. We have to look much, much beyond that. So what you can do as a business is, first, have the intention that you want to do it because you will be impacted by disability at some point in your life, like Rafat said. And you have to first evaluate where do we stand and what is our journey going to be. You have to build a roadmap with the help of an expert and see, plan a stepwise approach for you that where do we invest and when and how do we take that journey of inclusion. It's not a project you do once. If you commit to it, you will have to do it, keep on doing it forever because it always is developing and evolving, just like we humans are evolving. Hari, I would like to uh, come to you. I mean, Neha talked about the human element, right? While technology is great to scale things up, and of course, we've been talking about AI planning, you know, uh, travel and everything, but for an experiences-led product like yours, how crucial is the human element when it comes to hand-holding? You know, you've, you've talked about the famous touch plus tech model, right? So, so how crucial is that? So I think it's, it's bang on very crucial because, uh, like you clearly said, it's a touch plus tech model because your average transaction value on a holiday is roughly about $4,000. So it's not a come, click, add to cart, and then buy, right? So that's one aspect. And second aspect, there's a lot of value in curation and advice. I'm sorry, you're saying that uh, your, the average uh, trip cost is about $4,000? Yes. So right. clearly, so, that's yeah, not... It's a, it's a lot of money, yeah. right? so, so people are not going to just come in... First of all, say, your prices are not accessible. <laughs> <laughs> the top 1-2% in India, like I said. Right? But uh, coming back, uh, there is a lot of value in curation. right? And it's, it's a lot of times, uh, unlike many other countries, Indian travelers are always seeking newer destinations. right? So every time you're going to a newer destination, there is a lot of value that somebody can add uh, based on your past experiences. right? Uh, and I think that's also where the touch also aspect comes in. 
And in destination, I think there's no way you can do away with touch, right? It could be a very simple thing like people losing their passports, people leaving things in the cab, right? Uh, there's this little bit of panic that is always associated when you're spending two, three days in a city. And I think that bit of reassurance is, goes a long way in building the brand. And in fact, some of our uh, best to, avenues to build a brand is when people are in crisis. And that's why that you don't want to be on an IVR right, waiting to kind of get help. And that's where a real-time support, 24-7 concierge kind of really goes a long way in, in helping solve customer experience point points. Mm -hmm. Neha, when you were speaking to me earlier, you were talking about, you know, when it comes to technology, you were saying that the basic thing, like the travel websites are not accessible to all. So, you know, the travel, if the travel content is not accessible to people with disabilities, how do people book their travels? So we have, we have a very august crowd here, so can you educate them a bit? Sure. So see, like I mentioned, you have to look at all the touch points right from the point a traveler thinks about traveling. So the travel content, we make such fancy videos of travel. Is it accessible? Like think about it, whom you are excluding at that point in time. Can a blind person watch those fancy videos which you have just music around? Or if there is a nice voiceover, do you have captions in the first place so that a deaf person can access it? And when we are talking about booking website, is your website accessible to even book it? Your social media, like we cannot live without social media when it comes to travel. Is your social media content accessible? Like it starts from simple as adding alt text to your pictures that you post on social media. It's, it's really no rocket science, it's pretty simple. But then that's, we are not even doing these simple steps. And technology can be a game changer. Let me give you some very examples that you do use every day. You use a keyboard, right, on your laptops. Keyboard is a successor to the typewriter, which was invented for the blind. The zoom in and zoom out feature on your phone that you use, it was invented for people with low vision. We cannot think about without texting. It was invented for deaf people. The voice-based Alexa technology, it was invented for people with severe mobility impairments to control their environment. Can all of you imagine your life without it? No. That is mainstreaming of assistive technology. So if you do that, in, like you do these simple steps, it doesn't just make an experience for disabled people better, it makes a better experience for everyone, not just disabled people. And indoor navigation technology inside a hotel will not only help a blind person navigate the hotel independently, but will also help people who can get lost around a big resort to find their room. Uh -huh. um, Neha, I want to touch upon a different part of technology, which Neha, of course, spoke about and you spoke about earlier about social media. What is the importance of social media for a company like yours to spread the word and uh, this is a two-part question. And the second part is that, of course, you've hosted celebrities like Tom Holland, Zendaya, and Nigella Lawson. So uh, how, how do these celebrity brandings help you to further the cause? I mean, we, th there's a publication that called us uh, the new celebrity guides in town. And we were like, we don't, we don't mind this exaggerated news headline at all. <laughs> We'd like to be known as that. Um, social media has really helped us, I think, uh, I think people like us have come into this business because we're very, very passionate about sharing the best stories about our destination. Um, and so it, the storytelling transfers from what we do on ground to social media as well. Uh, I think all our uh, patrons, customers who support us know that when they're traveling with no footprints, they will be getting to do something unique. Uh, and to take your, uh, uh, to, to answer something uh, that you asked Hari actually, uh, I really think that is the new luxury redefined today. Um, I think in our tours, you get access to somebody who was with the, you know, is an eighth generation perfumer who has been serving the Mughals, you know, ittas, and you're getting face time with them and learning how to make your own perfume. Um, and so we're actually very lucky that we get to hear that feedback all the time that, um, you know, in the age of AI, what we did with you, we couldn't have done it on our own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think like, if, if you had to narrow down to the best feedback we hear, I think that's, that's, that's our most favorite. Uh, and I think social media definitely helps us push that. It helps us build that solid positioning. Um, everybody kind of like, seems to know that No Footprints is focusing on 
stories of community, stories of culture. They love their destinations. Uh, and so we also, it also helps us in getting a very like-minded traveler. And celebrities are Sone Pe Sohaga. Sone Pe Sohaga. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Hari, about celebrities, of course, my colleagues uh, have mentioned Shah Rukh Khan a lot. And I am the fan of Shah Rukh Khan at Skift. So, uh, you know, celebrity branding helps a lot. So, uh, you know, we have OTAs doing that. We have airlines doing that. Uh, so, do we see Pick Your Trail coming up with a celebrity brand ambassador? Of course, you need a lot of funding for that, but still. No, I think uh, we've kind of worked with a bunch of celebrities uh, from a collaboration perspective, like she said. I think uh, in, in our business, uh, I come from an FMCG background. So, in FMCG background, when your products are very similar, right, a celebrity boosts the secret of my energy, right, beautifully sells with Sachin and Dhoni and whatnot. But then in something which is likely more experiential, like Pick Your Trail, uh, the celebrity can get customers to your door, but the conversion still depends on so many other aspects, right? So I think it's a function of uh, what really you aim to do with a celebrity, which I think is very critical. For us, it works beautifully. For example, uh, Aishwarya Rai Bachchan, Abhishek Bachchan, right? Uh, we've had many people travel with us. Neeraj Chopra uh, did right after his Olympics. It was a random Twitter reach out, and he collaborated with us for Dubai. Uh, but I think so tactically it makes sense for destinations like you see destination tourism boards also engaging celebrities. But from a pure play uh, current business model, I think uh, maybe not the best investment and ROI. Yeah, but if you did, then who is the celebrity uh, brand ambassador in your wish list? Please say Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then let's go with Shah Rukh Khan. But I think uh, we're huge cricket buffs, so uh, maybe Mahi or Dhoni or I mean, yeah. Uh, my last. Delhi and he lives in Mumbai, so I, I get that picture. <laughs> okay, <first. laughs> okay, whoever, one of you. Yeah. Um, my last question is for Isha and Neha. I, I mean, uh, both of you cater to an inbound uh, customer as well. And when we are talking about, um, you know, the inbound customer, let us also address the female traveler, the single female traveler coming into India. Of course, there have been a lot of, uh, you know, headlines have been made about what happened with uh, you know the traveler from in Jharkhand, so how how do we make it more uh, accessible and more uh, safe? So, so at our level, I think where our primary focus is into representation when we do inclusive travel, and where we're okay to own all truths, like mm -hmm. really wonderful truths about the destination, and some very uncomfortable truths also. Yeah. So the Basti Sisterhood tour, which yes. you've actually done. Yeah is about the story about the great gender disparity yes. that continues to be you know, something that women face in Delhi. Uh, so at a storytelling te level, like we're happy to be vulnerable and own all truths about the destination mm -hmm. and do like sort of like a interesting travel take on it. Um, at an on-ground level, I feel like context matters so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we shifted the positioning as uh, industry players from molly coddling and kind of like brushing it away to actually mm -hmm. context, it would help a lot. So for instance, uh, even when we're on ground and if you know there are women travelers and they get off at Old Delhi, they're sometimes surrounded by scores of people who want a lot of selfie requests, which can be super overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, but in our script as well, we just, we make a nice joke about it. We're like, you know, this is, this is the way that we show love in India. Uh, okay. You know, we can, yeah. you know, uh, we can be your brown bouncers mm -hmm. if, it, if it need to be, but like, okay. you know, this is, and I feel like that, that helps a, a while, but sorry, just yeah. last bit, I think infrastructure challenges, of course, is something that is a long way to go, mm -hmm. um, and long way for us also to learn as an organization. Neha, very short. Yeah, uh, I think it's all about uh, the planning for all, mitigating all the risks that might occur, because I, I'm born to parents with disabilities, and I understand that with disability comes an extra vulnerability. Like if you are a woman, and if you are a woman with disabilities, you are double disadvantaged, and then you have to make extra preparation that how do you make it more safer for a woman with disabilities. So that on ground, like working with only people you can trust, who can I trust my life with, I would give it to our guest or make sure that, you know, like, they are always safe, and they are always in a safe environment. You won't put them into a risk situation at all. Mm -hmm. So this is something you have to work with and okay. live with, I would say. Okay. Thank you very much for your insights today. It was great talking to all three of you. Thank you, Thank Thank you so you. much. Thank you.